All right. I would read you this slide, but I'm going to assume that all of you can read it, so then I don't have to. So please welcome Jason. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Just glad, to, glad to be here. I'm uh, Jason Chan. I lead the cloud security team at Netflix. Um, so Netflix is a video streaming provider. I've got a good plug from the audience there. Appreciate that. Uh, we take, we make a bunch of our own content. We take a bunch more content and then we send it over the internet. You can watch it on whatever device you want without ads, kind of from anywhere. Uh, my team is responsible for protecting all that infrastructure and the systems. So just to reiterate, reiterate, I'm the security guy. I can't uh, make the new season of Stranger Things come any faster or Narcos. Um, I have to wait like everybody else. Uh, so I've been at Netflix going on about six years or so. And the more I work in technology, the more I realize that the solutions to our really gnarly problems are pretty much multidisciplinary in nature, uh, meaning that they don't really just have a technical solution, right? There's a human element. Uh, there's other things to consider, and that's why fields like UX and human-computer interaction exist. And what I want to do is kind of take that one step further and say, in addition to the human element, there's also this idea of history, and specifically this idea of shared history. And what I want to talk specifically about is the relationships between developers and security people. And so I've been working in security pretty much my whole career. Uh, I'm also a software developer. Um, I've witnessed or been a part of lots of really interesting uh, interactions between developers and security folks. And so I'm going to put my developer hat on and say, well, how would I describe that history or how would I describe those relationships between developers and security folks? Um, so this is the bridge keeper, if you've watched Money Python. And so just, you know, real simply, the bridge keeper, if you want to cross the bridge, you go talk to him. He's going to ask you some questions. You either get them correct or you die. Um, they, they could be arbitrary questions. You would have no reason to actually know the answer to those questions. And that's kind of how software folks look at security people. They're like, you know, you're always saying no. Like, you ask me these, you know, these real jargony questions. You're trying to slow me down. You know, why, you know, why are you there? And then if I think about what does the security person look at the, the engineer as a software developer, I found this guy. This guy's name is Dexter Tripp. He's a, he's a thrill show artist. And... So he's walking on this, this tripwire that's on fire. He also takes fireworks and duct tapes them to his chest, sets them off, and like lets kids in the audience throw water balloons at him uh, while he's juggling. And this is the kind of security view of software engineers. They're like, <laughs> like, you're using all this crazy stuff. You, want to do, you, know, you don't really think about the risk you're, 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 you're presenting. And if we, if we think a little bit more about, well, why, why would these uh, sort of per points of view persist? I would say it's, it's kind of natural based on why, really what our missions are. So this is a, you know, this is what I would say is a good description, the kind of modern uh, sort of slogan for software developers. And, and this, is, this is from Facebook a few years back, but I would say it's very correct. So the idea is that if you're not breaking something, you're probably not being aggressive enough in terms of moving fast. Uh, because why do you want to move fast? Well, you want to deliver features. You want to capture market share. You want to get customers. And, you know, engineers, you know, when, they, when they do good things, they get gold medals, and you get your picture taken, and you have champagne, right? This is what, this is what software engineering is, right? Is life, right, when you, when you do something good? So the security, security folks also have a mantra, but it's, it's more like this. And so I took this picture at a hardware store a couple years ago. But in it, so it refers to workplace safety, but I think it also works for security because like, when I go to work, I don't want anything to happen. So I don't want anything bad to happen. So a good way to make sure nothing bad happens is to make sure nothing at all happens. <laughs> and then our celebration is not really, you know, we don't, we don't get our pictures taken. We're just, you know, kind of sleep and, and nothing bothers us. So that kind of leads to the situation of, well, how is this ever going to work out? And not just with this legacy, this history, but also, like, think about, really at the, the nature of this conference, right? Everything that we are doing nowadays is actually geared towards moving faster. It's not towards going slower. So think about containers or infrastructure as code or continuous deployment. All of these kinds of things are intended to allow engineering teams to move faster. So how do we kind of reconcile that? And from my perspective, what, what we do or what we can do is, is realize that the opportunities developers have are the same that security teams have. We can also take advantage of those. 
And so that's kind of the thesis for the talk is that if we, t if we as a security folks or people who are building security tools or infrastructure tools take advantage of those opportunities, and we also bear in mind the history that this, some of these problematic histories, we actually can, can not only improve security but also improve relationships. So that's kind of my infomercial um, slogan. And so I know when I come to talks, I like to hear about what people are actually working on in the real world, how they're solving problems. That's kind of what I, what I want to do. I want to talk about some software we've built at Netflix and we've open sourced over the last few years, kind of how we do things. Um, and so this is, there's, there's a few different types of security automation I want to talk about. This is not really like comprehensive taxonomy, but so there's developer facing tools that like my team would build so that software engineers can use. There's this whole field of collaboration between developers and security teams. And then finally, there's internal security tools. Uh, these are tools that we would build to make ourselves more effective and more efficient. So I want to basically give an example of each one of these and sort of talk about how if you have some thoughtful design, you can, you can really make things quite a bit better. The first thing I want to start with is developer-facing tools. And we had a good, good taste of this, I think, in the keynote about, um, you know, this is a real fun topic that all software engineers like to work on, uh, SSL and TLS. And so these are pretty much, um, it's, for, for security folks, it's, we love it and we hate it. So we love it because it's relatively well penetrated. There's a lot of folks using it. Um, it solves a lot of hard security problems like protecting network communications and allowing servers and clients to authenticate themselves. But we dislike it because it has, there's a lot of problems with it. So for example, has anybody ever had an outage or gotten paged when the SSL certificate expired? <laughs> yeah, that's happened to me. We're, I think we're all in good company. So, you know, Microsoft, Google, Instagram, you know, this is problematic. Certificates have a, have a, have a, a lifetime and when they expire, things break. So not only that, but to me, the, the interesting thing like with, with, with SSL is it's intended to provide a security function. But the systems that actually do that have had a, a really long history of very serious security problems. So this is the logo from Heartbleed. Anybody have to respond to that in 2014? That was a fun one. So basically the exact thing that, that OpenSSL was trying to do, it failed at. And then it you know, failed pretty spectacularly. Um, a lot of these bugs, they tend to have good logos or you know, acronyms like Poodle or Beast. Um, so there's lots of problems. And then, so assuming you can take care, care of the expiration part, you can take care of the security bugs, it's still like really difficult to, to handle PKI and SSL. So like, how, do you, how do you actually create an SSL certificate? How do you get that? It's really quite complicated. And the decisions you make while you're doing it are very important. And the process whereby you do it, there's a lot of like potential security problems. Like if you're creating SSL certs and, and, and uh, requests from your laptop, there's a lot of problems that could, that could happen there from a security perspective. So we, we sort of recognize these problems. And what we wanted to do was you know, see if we could address some of these and, and make security better. And so what we did was we built a system a couple of years ago called Lemur. It was actually. Um, the, the real, I guess, inspiration was responding to Heartbleed because we had to, we had to uh, regenerate a whole bunch of SSL certificates. So Lemur is available on our, on our GitHub page. Um, and basically what we try to do with Lemur is just make it a one-stop shop for all your SSL certificate requirements. So with Lemur, you can request a cert, you can provision it, you can deploy it, you can monitor it. All that kind of stuff is taken care of for you. And we also have a bunch of plug, it's a plug-in architecture, so you can extend it pretty much uh, infinitely. Just a couple of real quick screenshots here. So whereby you used to have to, you know, Google and figure out, you know, read the OpenSSL man page and figure out how to create a, you know, a CSR and a key pair. Just go to Lemur. You put in your, you see here, uh, you basically, down at the bottom, I have the name of my certificate, jason.netflix.com. It's my new great certificate. I choose the certificate authority that's going to create it. So we use VeriSign for most of our public requirements. And then, there's, so there's a bunch more advanced options if you want to, but what we do is as a security team, we kind of decide what all those things should be. We just set them up. You just click create. So in like two minutes, you can uh, actually have this done for you. And you'll see here at the bottom, this destinations. So not only does Lemur generate the key pair for you, create the certificate, get it back, but it actually will deploy it to you, for you to AWS. So we use AWS. Uh, we primarily use load balancers or ELBs to terminate SSL. So Lemur will take care of all that for you. Um, so in one fell swoop, you're able to request it, 
and you know have it automatically deployed in AWS so it's available for your uh, your load balancers. And so what we did there, you know, what we tried to do is we, we, we tried to use those new opportunities we have. So our certificate authority has an API. We may as well integrate it with it. Obviously, Amazon has AW, uh, APIs, so we took advantage of those. Uh, and it, just really to solve a really, you know, what feels like it should be straightforward, but it's actually really difficult. And along the way, increased security. So I would say we increased security by protecting the process, but, but, but also by making it easier and make security more ubiquitous. And then also increasing reliability so that there's really, we have complete visibility of all deployed certificates. The right folks get reminded when they're going to expire and all that kind of stuff. So the next uh, example, so that was kind of, you know, tools that we would build for developers. The next, next thing I want to talk about is, is collaboration between developers and security folks. Um, so the old ways of collaborating, um, you know, lots of different fun ways that we would collaborate, uh, you know, skirmishes and meetings and, you know, maybe some brouhaha's. Uh, change review boards, anybody ever have to go to a change review board to talk about a security change? Um, filing tickets, stuff like that. So it's kind of kludgy, sort of manual, a lot of, you know, hey, let me ask if I can do this, and I don't really know how somebody's going to evaluate that request. They might just say no. So what we wanted to do is kind of get rid of that because it's not really, it doesn't really promote high velocity either. So we'll look at a case study. And this is specifically around permissions management in AWS. Um, so um, we, we, we pretty much run our entire service on AWS. I imagine a lot of folks here use, use AWS or other cloud-type services. Um, and if, you've, if you have any experience with it, you know that, well, the, the public cloud is, is really neat, but so it's cool to spin up an instance and you know, store something somewhere, but really the magic happens when you take all those different components and you put them together and you sort of combine them and, and deliver something awesome. So I guess what we do with the Netflix streaming service, we use a bunch of different AWS services. Amazon takes care of all the infrastructure. We just sort of put it together and then deliver TV shows. But the nature of that is that to be able to do things like launch an instance or store a file or use a stream processor or whatever, you need to have permissions to do that, right? Either as a user or as a system. And Amazon actually has over 2,500 different API calls, and this is increasing all the time. But so 2,500 different ways that you can say, yes, you can do it, no, you can't do it. A very complicated, or not complicated, very rich uh, policy language of how you can do exceptions and conditions and all this kinds of things. So it's, it's, it's pretty complicated. And for the most part, what we try to do is hide this from the developer, because most of our developers don't really need to care about this. But there are like a core set of, of developers that we support that are doing kind of platform infrastructure stuff. So they're pretty in the weeds with AWS along with us. Um, and for those folks who wanted to give them a better way to do this, um, because the, the problem with access control in general, it's kind of a, a, a Goldilocks and the Three Bears problem, where if you give too much access, you can cause security problems because you know, the system has more rights than it needs. If you give too little, then somebody's going to come yell at me because they can't do what they need. So you want that, that just right. And that's, it's a pretty difficult, uh, pretty long-standing problem in the security community about how to do this the right way. Um, so one of the ways that we did it for this, this sort of like power user community that needs to um, basically have more granular control is uh, we, we built a system called Roly Poly. And I believe this is not the correct spelling, but um, at Netflix, if you create something, you get to name it, as well as, I guess, get to choose the spelling. Um, and so Roly Poly is just a system where it's, it's our overall permissions and roles, role management system. So we, we store all this as, because uh, an AWS policy file is just a JSON file. So we store all that in our um, sort of internal source code repo. And then what we, what we wanted to do was get allow people to interact with this in a more real-time fashion. So we use, you know, chat ops is kind of a, a new thing. And so this is a screenshot of what's going on here. So Otterbot is, is our security bot that hangs out in our chat room. And basically what would happen is a developer would realize, hey, AWS just, real, just launched a new service. I want to be able to use that. By default, you wouldn't have the rights to do it. So then they would say, hey, well, let me give, you, give me rights to new service X. And what they would do is they would just simply raise a pull request. And what would happen is Roly Poly would recognize that there's a pull request that needs to be looked at, would notify this room. And what you see here is uh, Ben, who's on the, our security operations team, just runs a, runs a chat command to describe that pull request and can you know, obviously just handle it like any other pull request. And then actually with a, with also with a chat command, you can approve the pull request. 
And because this is a, you know, it's a sensitive operation to be changing permissions, what happens is then Otterbot kicks off a, um, a command to basically push down a, a two-factor authentication challenge to Ben it's, uh, so that he would have to approve that. And then upon approval, what Roly-Poly does is it moves in that change and then deploys that, um, that policy globally to wherever, whatever various AWS environments we needed in. So benefits of Roly-Poly, it's transparent, it's transparent decision-making. Right? If, like, if you're going to approve or deny something via pull request, it's pretty clear you know, what's being evaluated there. And one of the real keys, I think, that we've gotten a lot of good feedback on this from our internal users is that these are like engineering native workflows. Like developers do pull requests all the time. Right? This, is their, this is the bread and butter. Um, and it's automated, it's secure, consistent. There's no, hey, who did that? It's all audited. It's all, you know, basically, you can, you can ensure that it's, it's globally consistent. And then the last um, sort of piece of, or I guess type of security automation I wanted to talk about is internal security tooling. And I know, um, you know there, there's, security's been a little bit different than the rest of like the ops systems world in terms of how fast we've been able to innovate in terms of security automation. Uh, I just wanted to kind of give a brief history of, of, of security automation in, in one slide. Um, this is, uh, if you're familiar with these, these are what, what you'd call a Rube Goldberg machine. And so these are basically really brittle and complicated systems to do something really simple. So this, this guy here, um, he wants to wipe his face with a napkin. So, of course, you, you involve a parrot and there's like a, a rocket that's going to cut that thread over on the right-hand side. So this is kind of what security automation has looked like, at least since I've been in the field, up until like the last five, ten years or so. And the reason why is it's largely market driven. We didn't really have access to a lot of open source tools. So we were kind of forced into vendor solutions and security vendors are very keen on controlling their market. So they have proprietary data stores, they don't have APIs, you know, they have really crappy web UIs that you have to scrape. And so as security teams, we would spend a lot of time building really, really brittle systems to do simple things. Um, but of course, as I mentioned earlier, you know, we have access to a lot, a lot more capabilities now, and hence we can build more sophisticated tools. And the example I want to give in this, in this uh, scenario is a system we have called Dirty Laundry. And this is actually version two of something we open sourced in 2014 called Scumbler. Uh, Scumbler was, was originally envisioned as what we would call an intelligence gathering tool. Because security teams do stuff like, like one, of, one of the things that we would do is, we wanted to, for, you know, what happens to Netflix accounts sometimes is somebody will try to resell them on eBay, some stolen accounts, or somebody will be chatting on Twitter that, hey, I'm going to do a you know, denial of service against Netflix. So what we wanted to do as a security team is be able to proactively discover those and then be able to handle those. So that's what Scumbler does. Is it, it has this, this search provider engine that goes out and you can, you know, we have integrations with stuff like Twitter and eBay and Facebook. So you can go out and do these searches, bring back materials. But what we found is that with all of the components and processes associated with high velocity development and, and continuous deployment, we can actually turn Scumbler inside to those systems and, and pull lots of interesting security information from our own internal systems. So that's what Dirty Laundry does. And the approach is, I, I kind of describe it like it's a sort of Unix-like philosophy. You have these little tasks that run and they bring you back some results. You process that. You can maybe iterate, send it somewhere else. Uh, just a couple of examples, that you, something you might do with dirty laundry is you go out and find the new load balancers that have been created that might be, might be facing the internet, run some security tests against it, and then return the results. Uh, another example that we'll look at in just a little bit, you might want to say, hey, show me all Netflix employees who have a GitHub account, then go look in their public repos for security issues, so potentially sensitive things that may have been committed because this happens all the time, and then return those results and let us do something with it. So we have current support for a bunch of different things, uh, so dynamic analysis tools, uh, static analysis, um, and then other sort of custom things that we built. Uh, and an example here, so this is a task. Um, I mentioned the GitHub search. So we, we've already built a search provider for GitHub for, that uses GitHub's API. And what you'll see down here in the search terms, these are things that basically if they show up in something that you've checked into GitHub, it could be a security problem. So we want to be proactive. We want to go find those things and bring them back. And this is a result here. So this is, um, you know, some of the more sensitive stuff is, is blocked out. But what we're doing is we're going out and looking various repos, see if there's any potential security problems, bring it back, and then we can do something with it. 
And what we're trying to do with dirty laundry, right, what I would say the benefits are is it really embraces the idea of continuous deployment and self-service with really like safer high velocity development. Because I think the interesting thing, thing that security folks are starting to realize with, with high velocity development and continuous deployment is that the, the nature of that system where you have good integration tests, you're doing small releases, and you have a lot of telemetry and observability in your production environment, that you have a lower chance of releasing a bug to production, but because you have the visibility, you, you, you'll catch it faster. So what we try to do is the same thing was from a security perspective, because security bugs or security vulnerabilities are just bugs that have a security context. And then what this has helped us do is decouple a push schedule from what bandwidth my team might have to help a developer. So one of the common things I had in, in, in the earlier parts of my career was you get into these, these, these really interesting conversations where the development team has just spent however long it's taken to, to, to get ready for their new release, and then they're like, oh, well, the security people haven't said we can push the code yet. So that, that doesn't really help the relationship. So what Dirty Laundry allows us to do is decouple those things. So go ahead and release code um, whenever you want, as quickly as you want, and what we'll do is provide the tooling and the infrastructure to go find potential security problems. So just generalized takeaways. Um, so security teams, again, we can leverage the same sort of benefits that, that the broader engineering community can do. Um, and I think I'm, I'm, I'm really getting um, more and more of this is like, if you really think about what kind of human problems you've had in the past, like try to learn from that and use that to influence how you prioritize what kind of tools you're gonna build. And then as much as possible, you wanna, you wanna provide people tools that they're gonna be familiar with and they're familiar with their workflows. And then Really, I think by, by solving problems in this way, you're going to make security more ubiquitous and potentially even have uh, additional uh, benefits from there. Thank you. <laughs> questions? Any questions? Uh, the last talk talked about how network engineers are policy experts, not coders. Yeah. I wonder, yeah, how do you deal with um, hiring talent that has security policy expertise yep. and then turning them into production engineers? Yeah, that, that's a good question. Um, I, think, I think security has had that same problem where the general folks that got into the field are not necessarily software developers. So, like, the composition of my team, it's... You know, most people are, um, you know, at least reasonable developers. Um, there's a relative, you know, minority of those folks who, who, because we also do build parts of the production service. So some folks are, you know, what I guess I would call production quality software engineers. Um, we have other folks who are, you know, they're, they're self-taught. They do scripting and things like that. So I think it's a little bit of, of, of um, you know, you, I think what we're, what we're looking to do more is hire folks who are, who have higher level software engineering skills and, you know, maybe have an interest in security or have worked on security products who understand and then, because they can build the tools and the systems for you. And then for the folks that have to do real high touch engagements where you have to maybe consult with engineers on building things in a secure way, that has to have a little bit of a different background. But ideally you can get both, but yeah, they're, they're pretty, pretty rare to find. All right, thank, thank you, you very much. All right, we've come upon the lunch hour, uh, which is longer than an hour. But if you go to atomicon.io slash lunch, you can actually see kind of what's around for the, the foods. Uh, there, there are food carts uh, in 10th and Alder, which is yonder, and that's probably the easiest and fastest place with the most variety. Um, if you're not native to Portland, food carts are